Now, here's, here's the interesting uh, sequel to the fact that the number of complainants was much smaller than the aggregate number of complaints received by election committee. Right? Remember I said there was a 42% overlap. 42% of the, of the complainants received both kinds of calls. What that, what that indicates is that there were 1.1 million fraudulent calls that went to a substantially smaller number of people. Okay, now I, I, I don't, I, I think what one's getting into very loose approximations uh, to, to try and guesstimate what the, what the actual number of people who received the calls were. So I, I, I prefer simply to say we, we know that there's about 1.1 million uh, of, of the calls. Now, should I also answer the question about uh, the CPC audits? Or, or would you rather... Okay, I'm going to discuss it. Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to discuss it. Okay. So I just want to add some um, other information that came up in the admitted facts at the SONA trial, which really received um, very, very little media attention. And that was when Matt Meyer um, went into his own um, system to try and figure out what had gone out from RAC9. He found the False Elections Canada recording, and he also found a recording which purported to be from Frank Valeria's campaign asking for support. That call was never sent, but it was staged to go out between 4.30 a.m. in the morning and 6 a.m. in the morning. And the list of names that was uploaded for that message exactly matched the list of names which was used for the Fraudulent Elections Canada call, which exactly matched the non-supporter list in the Guelph Conservative Information Management System. So again, we heard all of these reports in other writings about middle of the night calls, and the evidence of one of them was on the RAC9 server, and it's documented in the admitted facts of this case. have been done in terms of civil action on the part of Canadians to sue the Conservative Party of Canada, given the volume of evidence that's out there. Is this uh, Professor Kiefer? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, comp uh, it's a complex situation. So from having sat through the trial, I am left asking the question, how is it that um, agents of an organization acting in the interests of an organization, using the resources of an organization, can carry out a crime, but that the organization itself has no liability whatsoever? So when you have a company like, like um, SNC-Lavalin, who has been involved in issues of bribery internationally, it's, it's the organization that pays the price, not just the people within it. Um, so under the criminal code, organizations can be held liable for being party to an offense under certain situations. And that's, um, from my reading, if uh, officers of the organization have been involved in the crime, if there are issues of uh, negligence on the part of the organization. So again, if you get a chance to dig into the admitted facts, only six people um, on the Martinburg campaign had password-protected access to the CIMIS database. So they're vetted by the Conservative Party and they're trained by the Conservative Party. What we learned at the trial is that every time someone would log into uh, the database using their own password, that session would be logged. So you could see that Mike Schreiner was on the database from 10 a.m. to 10.14. That, <coughs> you know, sorry Mike, it's, it's really out there. But that, but that everything that was logged on, every time you logged on, your session was monitored. If you exported data from the database, that was also recorded. 
unless you used um, an aspect of the database where you downloaded something called a constituent report, in which case the exported data would leave no trace whatsoever in the system. And when Chris Rougier, the conservative staffer responsible for the system, took the stand, he was not able to explain to the courtroom that um, aspect of the database. So in the Mosley trial, um, the justice found that the database was accessed by persons unknown. And I think in the Sona trial, we learned how that could have happened. So we have a situation where either uh, the database was used by, for criminal purposes by people within the campaign, or there was an unprecedented and unbelievable breach of the database from some University of Guelph hackers, which was never reported to the police or investigated, as far as I know. So, you know, I, I think there really are a number of outstanding things. You know, who, we know that many people um, from this campaign were involved. We know that the Conservative Party resources were used. And there are questions, you know, does that failure to secure the database, does that constitute negligence? I think those are really good questions. Just to quickly supplement what Susan said, um, we know from the court documents uh, in the Soma trial as well that one of the young conservative staffers who testified against Michael Soma um, was the person who downloaded, using that constituent report facility, uh, two sets of phone numbers from uh, the SIMS database, uh, I believe on April 30th. Um, so those would have been the lists that were used to send out the Pierre Jones slash Pierre Putin robocalls. Um, under cross-examination, he was asked whether it would have been common for him to pass on such a list to Michael Sona, and he said, no, very uncommon, uh, but it would have been quite routine for him to have passed on such a list to Andrew Prescott. So we, we have in the, in the trial records uh, an indication of at least uh, one possible route by which that data from the SIMS database. Uh, all, all that we know is that, is that the downloads that were made in the preceding days by other members of the, of the Guelph Conservative staff uh, contained too few numbers to have been the, the ones that, that, that were used to send out the rack nine calls. So it had to be those two constituent report downloads. So we, we do have a sense of, of what the what the trail of the of the data must have been. Hello, <clears throat> Hello my name is Nicola Martin. I'm a citizen who received a ripple call uh, around nine-ish, I'm sure, in the morning, and made several calls. And I have my memory is really bad, but I don't believe there was any follow-up. So I'm really appreciating today, and I know I've had conversations with Susan on the fly about the Sona. Sona. Sona yeah. trial. Uh, and I know she's been thinking about this lots. I have a couple of points and, um, and, and a question. Uh, one of the points is I, I actually also believe in proportional representation, but I, 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 I'm a bit concerned that um, if Fairbo Canada was to, or Fairbo Guelph was to sort of take um, the lead in, in this at this point, unless, unless I hear something else. That the, that the PR issue is going to take forefront. I think this is important enough in itself that we have to think about raising money and moving forward with this issue. Um, the, question, the question that I have is whether anyone's thought about, uh, because what I've, I'm hearing today is, is like that we're blocked everywhere we look, whether it's through the justice system, um, through Elections Canada, but oh, has anyone taken a look at the UN as a possible place to look? Because we're sending people out to, to look at so that, look at election board. So why, why can they not bring some people in here to look at election board?
do a quick fact sheet that could go on a Facebook. It's not, I'm not on Facebook anymore. Hey, come on, on a web page. Just two ideas. Thanks very much. I'd be happy to share the, the figures that, that I presented today. Um, one, one thing that could be mentioned as a possibility, as a possible form of action, members of the legal profession um, involved and elsewhere in Canada, I think, could look closely at the behavior of some of the of their legal colleagues uh, uh, in this global cult affair, because there, there are quite senior lawyers working for the Conservative Party uh, who appear at various points in this story, and there's, I think, a significant question as to whether some of their behavior is behavior that, that calls for disciplinary members, uh, disciplinary measures uh, on the part of the legal profession. To speak to the question about uh, fair vote, yes, fair vote is committed to proportional representation as our, our goal and a way of uh, inoculating Canada's democracy from these types of uh, fraudulent and other types of toxic behavior. Um, and, you know, Council of Canadians, they are in the process of uh, taking this to court. May, are you going to speak to this course, Council of Canadians? No, maybe not. Uh, I, I don't know, Nora or, or John Dennis, if either want to speak again to what the Council of Canadians are doing to raise funds to bring this to court more, that would be a, a great way to bring forward. Yes, sir. My name is Brian Holstein, and uh, firstly, before I start, I think that any attempt to get to the bottom of this uh, with the present government <laughs> is as effective as whistling or doing other things into the wind. And if we try it, the results on us is going to be the same as doing those other things into the wind. So that's the first step. Secondly, I'm fixated, my main reason for being here, I'm fixated by the returning officer, the episode with that. The harassment calls did not end on election day. Obviously, they were taking place last week. When suddenly our election... Suddenly our returning officer was not going to come here. Now perhaps, perhaps the lawyer had it right. Perhaps she could not do that. But given that Ms. Bodra made an impact statement. Now if she had used an electric typewriter with one, maybe even two carbon copies, then I could understand her not having a copy. But being the Electoral officer, I think she probably uses a computer. And to think that a, a, either a statement such as this, about which she can be questioned, perhaps in court, in a future day, that she did not keep a copy of this, is unbelievable. Yeah, let's leave it at unbelievable. And like I said, it's a, it's a suppression of information, and ain't nothing going to happen. Well, we've got Mr. Harper and company at the front. First step, two of them. And my question, if you need a question, is <laughs> what, what attempt is being made at $3 a page to obtain her copy of the, uh, uh, the impact statement? I think it's $6. OK, so somebody is getting that. I mean, just having sat through it, uh, a victim impact statement um, just doesn't speak to the facts of a trial. It's really supposed to be limited to what were the impacts on you. So from what I remember her saying, it was an issue of, of all hell breaking loose on that day. And that she felt that many people um, personally blamed her for what had happened. So she, her reputation was attacked as somehow that she, as the representative of Elections Canada, was held responsible for it. So in that regard, it was um, definitely traumatic. And, and she also, to the media afterwards, expressed her upset that something like this would have happened. So, you know, that's just like a thumbnail from an observer point of view of what I heard her say. So it's, I don't think there's key information that we need to know that was there, but again, it would have put another human face, as everyone else did for us, on what the impacts of that action was. 
to find out if something is computer generated or was it a real person? If it was a real person, who was it? Because that person is an accessory to the crime, whose voice was on the fake uh, Franklin area. Whose voice was on the, was on the uh, middle of the night Frank Valeria call. So again, these are all kinds of questions which for me are not answered and that's why I want to see renewed calls for a full judicial inquiry. My name is uh, Andrew Van Pappen. I'll try to so I'm just gonna... Is that better? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so I wanted to speak to the culture issue, particularly around um, students brought up earlier. Um, as somebody who was studying at the University of Guelph in 2011, where I believe what was happened, the ballot box was attempted to be thrown out by the Conservative Party, or more particularly the Conservative Youth Organization on campus, I think there's a problem when that sort of culture is being produced to our young people, and we need to be um, outreaching to them better so they can get out and vote so they can make better informed decisions and so that they can actually see that what is going on and the behavior that is being perpetrated by the Conservative Party in particular and, I don't know, other random hackers on the university campus needs to be condemned and needs to be looked at more thoroughly than that has been done currently. And I want to know what kind of um, activities are being done by Fairville for to engage young people, to get them out to vote, and to make sure that they're aware that these sort of things are unethical. I worked on both of James Gordon's campaigns, and I've heard about campaign signs of ours and Karen Farbridge's ending up in Mississauga in a ditch somewhere. These things need to stop. They're going to continue, and we need to help engage young people because I think they're primarily the group that these negative impactors are using to get away with these sorts of things so they can claim that they just don't know better because they're a younger generation or something like that. So I'd really like to know what you're doing to kind of engage young people, get them more active in the topic. Right, could we take the last question as well and then uh, continue the conversation? Hi, I'd like to uh, follow um, my main comment, which is that based on the historical behavior of the Conservative Party, it's very likely that there will be uh, some kind of voter suppression in uh, 2015. And Professor Keeper, you mentioned that we can uh, make some um, estimates as to what that would be. You said you had some ideas you would share with us. So I'm wondering if you can uh, just make mention of those. I would just like to also, just to that point, uh, when Frank Valeri was asked why um, Guelph seemed to be the epicenter of uh, the robocall scandal, although we know it happened um, nationally as well, he says because we were on the ground making notes. We were aware of what was going on and we documented what was going on. And I would say that looking to 2015, it would be uh, you know, very wise of all of us to be very aware and documenting whatever comes our way and making those calls really early to elections in and whoever uh, might be of interest to specific party candidates. Yeah, but I'll leave it with you. Thank you.
the fraudulent phone calls also went out with this sort of fingerprint uh, tracking back to conservative party lines. Second piece of information is uh, comes from a study that was done in the spring of 2012 by CBC News, which established that there was a recurrent connection uh, that they mentioned in the, in the uh, CBC News report of the study, uh, 11 different writings, of people having received Conservative Party voter information calls and telling the caller, no, I'm not going to vote for you. I don't support Mr. Harper. And then receiving misinformation calls. And what the uh, CBC report established was that there was a systematic pattern that was occurring across uh, a significant number of writings. This was confirmed statistically by ECOS research, who discovered a statistically significant correlation between Conservative Party voter information calls answered with a no, I don't support Mr. Harper's statement, and people subsequently receiving misinformation calls. So that's, that's another set of fingerprints that, that indicate uh, Conservative Party responsibility for the fraud. In Guelph, the evidence here points quite clearly to the organization, not just of misinformation, but also of harassment calls from within the, the local Conservative Party office. There is the, the call that Susan mentioned, uh, which we know about only because it was to have been sent out early on the morning of May the 2nd. You'll remember that the Elections Canada investigator only asked for information about calls going out on May the 2nd. So what earlier harassment calls there might have been uh, emanating from the, the uh, complaints and data the assembled office. by Elections Canada um, led to further indication because it shows that the two kinds of calls were linked. The, the uh, misinformation calls about which we have from the Elections Canada emails and the, the ECOS and CBC studies, indications that they were uh, sent out by the Conservative Party or at the instigation of the Conservative Party. The complaints data indicates that these calls are statistically linked to the harassment calls. In other words, that the same agency was involved in sending out the two calls. The same intentionality uh, was involved in both kinds of fraud. And finally, there's a question of uh, who benefited. And again, there's statistical evidence from, uh, from the research of Anke Kessler at Simon Fraser University, the economist I mentioned, indicating a uh, vote suppression effect of 2% or about 2,000 votes per riding um, to the disfavor of liberal and NDP candidates running against conservative candidates in the two dozen odd ridings that she studied. And there's also evidence from ECOS research that indicates very clearly uh, the degree to which uh, opposition party supporters were targeted by the, uh, the misinformation calls. So overall, we have, we have pretty conclusive indications as to who the guilty party with a capital P is. Now, in terms of the prediction for the, the, this year's election, what I would suggest is that we can anticipate another comparatively low-tech form of fraud. I say low-tech because by comparison with what the Republican Party does in the United States, robocalls fraud is very low-tech. It, it, it doesn't involve hacking <coughs> uh, vote tabulation systems or uh, corrupted um, uh, voting machine, electronic voting machines and that sort of technology. What we can anticipate, I would suspect, is this. Remember that one of the reasons Elections Canada is toothless is that in 2007, the Conservative Party passed legislation that, in effect, reduced its, its investigative power. This was a deliberate act uh, that sort of went under the radar because the major part of that uh, piece of legislation was the fixed term election business, which all the news media focused on and which, of course, Mr. Harper proceeded to ignore uh, at his own pleasure, and may well uh, ignore again in this coming year. What the Fair Elections Act, so-called, did in this past year, one of the things it did, was to legalize the use of uh, communications devices in polling stations. 
So whereas previously scrutineers and other people were breaking the Canada Elections Act if they activated the cell phone in a voting place, as Michael Sony did during that special poll on the University of Guelph campus uh, back in early April. Um, now, that's perfectly legitimate, and cons two Conservative Party um, members of Parliament have developed a, these, these are obviously technically skilled people, uh, a, te a telephone app that allows cell phone users to be in detailed, instantaneous contact with the central database. So the scrutineers will be able to respond to the arrival of uh, voters presenting their identification in uh, particular polling stations and will be able to mount immediate identification challenges uh, based on information from their database. Now, the effect of, of this, this is, this is my, my, if you like, paranoid anticipation, the, the, the purpose behind this is not so much to prevent those people from voting as to gum up the whole works because what voter identity challenges have been shown to do uh, in Republican Party actions in, for example, African-American polling places in cities like Cleveland, Ohio, is to create enormous waiting times for the people who want to vote there. So this, is, this telephone app business is something that we can anticipate occurring in polling stations that, polling places that the Conservative Party knows historically vote NDP, Liberal, or Green, or some combination of that. They, they will be able to suppress the vote by simply making people wait. And, and elderly people, people with young children, uh, people who try to come up to vote during their lunch break, uh, uh, people with health problems and so on, will perhaps think twice if they're faced with a three hour, a four hour. In, in Cleveland, Ohio, people were waiting on a cold, rainy day on November the 2nd, 2004, for as much as seven and eight hours to vote. It's quite an effective way of uh, reducing the time. I'm a bird. Susan, after one minute, I'm going to stand up. So my response to both Michael and Sharon, my message is to get around all of these things is to vote advance. And I don't think most people realize that once the writ is dropped, the election is on. And the election isn't actually one day. It lasts for a 30-day period or more, whatever it is. And seven days a week, you can go into your local re returning office and cast your ballot any, of, any day of the election period. So that's the way to get around um, uh, ID hassles, phony calls, reduce the lineup for everybody else. Is, you know, and I, I always vote advance, and it's never taken me more than five minutes. So that's the message to get out, is that everybody, you know, everybody can and should vote advance throughout that 30-day period. <laughs> Things can happen in the last week, two weeks of an election, an election race. So I thought it would be more. You may pre vote it a month, by a month, yeah. and then you discover that the Mr. or Mrs. X or Miss X uh, has done something that you really don't appreciate. So you can vote one day before, or two, day, two days before. In the provincial election, I voted. Two weeks ahead, it may be. Correct. But, but still, you can go the day before. The, the infamous. Mayor of Chicago, Richard Daly, would have an answer to your problem. He would say, vote early and vote often. <laughs> um, I think voting early might be an answer. <laughs>